as the tallest here. I'm, I'm down here. I'm not this short usually, but this Aww. is deuce, everybody. It is. Mm. But I'm cringing because my body is not feeling the best right now. And I think that really came off in my performance. Um, yeah. We have a start off question or something. Um, I don't know, but a lot of my work is conceptual, and this one was basically how how do you feel the sounds and textures around you in your body when you don't really even feel like you're in your body, and so I was really exploring that. Um, yeah, I don't know. What's the, what's the structure for this? <laughs> How do you feel? What do you do when you feel like you're not in your body? What do you listen to? What is it? What does it sound like to you? I don't know. Yeah, I love the video. Thank you, Zoe. Yeah, thank you. It's so good. It made me think a lot about the Lenny Lenape people whose land we're occupying right now and how they would use dance. And I, I often think of hearing, like hearing them and uh, like seeing them dance where like they, they would be. Um, and so I'm glad that you dove into history and in you're in the video as well. It's really important. Yeah, totally. I, I think that, yeah, there's so much, like, there's such a rich history of dance and movement and, like, responding to what's happening in the world and what's happening in our bodies and feelings in a lot of cultures. And I think, like, um, yeah, I think that it's not as, yeah, I feel... I think that like whiteness is like something that can like keep us from really feeling into into that um and can be like such a rigidity that we like learn in our bodies and that's like um and gender and just all these ways that like we might be taking in sound but not actually like letting ourselves have a, a response to it or like really like feel into it um so it's like one of the things i wanted to explore in the video made me think a lot about how birds sounds have changed to mimic what's around them so like the construction and and all that and how their their original sound i guess is lost well not all of them but how that affects wild like birds will just start like mimicking construction vehicles and things like that now instead of their own bird songs Um, did you know that in cave, um, in caves where there are paintings, like the really, really old, early cave paintings, um, it's also where the sound is the coolest in the cave. It's like, there are all these really cool, like, um, sonic events that can happen in these specific spots where people are, were like making also all these cool cave paintings so that I feel like is one of the I think it's one of the earliest examples of like um humans interacting with sound um or like you know one of the like recorded earliest recorded examples of that that makes me think of um the space that we're in which is sort of cave-like covered in paintings and is also sonically really amazing. Um, I'm really glad that we got to perform here and it definitely like informed 
the way that I was thinking about our performance to know that we were going to be here, the sound of the traffic and like the wind and sometimes the train and the echoes of the bridge uh, was definitely on my mind a lot while we were practicing and like performing. Um, and like thinking about the way that birds mimic the sounds around them, I think we do that as humans too. It's been, in, in our music, we mimic the sounds around us and like, um, yeah, I think that manifested in performance tonight for sure. There is also this really cool moment in your set, Gladys, where you're making all this like whooshing and like cool wind sounds, and then the wind picked up, and it felt like you were like summoning the wind in this really powerful way. And you're just like totally, totally like hunched over and like scraping, and like the wind is picking up, and your hair was blowing, and it was so awesome. And that felt, um, yeah, reminded me of what you're saying, and also just felt like collaboration in a really, really ideal way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel like I always try and make myself as uncomfortable as possible to try and like push out and find what's next or what's coming in this like hyper present, which always trying to live in the present as much and it's very, it's very hard to do. Um, but yeah, thank you. Are, um, were any of you who performed today like listening to the sounds and like playing off of them at all? Like the sounds of the the road or the traffic or like like I'm sure you were subconsciously, but like were you doing it consciously at all? I get like so zoned in on performer mode um, that I don't really know what else is happening. I could kind of pay attention to Violet. I was paying attention to Violet, um, but that was like the limit of my attention because I just get like super lasered in and um, yeah, I couldn't tell you a single like external sound that um, happened during that performance. Um, but I know that there were things going on. I hope that it was cool. <laughs> totally. It was amazing. Cool. I think I definitely, I couldn't tell you anything specifically, but especially when I was playing saxophone and there were like some moments of like silence and kind of saxophone blowing and then some silence. I caught a couple like passing car on the bridge or uh, the wind. Um, it happened a lot while we were practicing. We were practicing in the Gray's Avenue warehouse. And like that the train, train is the train so is right there. awesome. Ugh. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I really enjoy the synchronicity of like, especially when I. That's why I like having a lot of dynamics in performance, where there's like a lot of loud and also a lot of quiet, because it lets room for some of those noises to come into the the music as well. Um, yeah. It was really a bummer, though, when we would be, like, 20 minutes into our, like, rehearsal. We're at the quiet moment where we're, we're like, slowing down, and then the train comes through. It's like, you missed your cue. You were supposed to come in, like, 20 minutes before. Yeah, they didn't get our memo. Yeah, they I wasn't into that. It really felt like the two of you were in sync, though. You didn't have to look at each other, you know, that you could feel where it is you were going next. And that... I think is really interesting as someone who, I guess, mostly performs alone. I think it's really hard to do that. Um, we also yeah. both normally perform alone. Yeah, I haven't, with like a couple exceptions, for the last like five years, I've basically been performing alone. Um, it just, and it has really changed my performance style too, to, to collaborate. Um, I think it makes me feel like I can take more risks and take like slow things down and open things up and I don't have to be playing all the time. Um, I can like pause and listen to Anna. It's great. It feels great. <laughs> That's cool. It throws me into like a chaotic frenzy where I have no clue what I'm doing and I just like accumulate trash for months and then somehow the trash makes the sounds I want and then we kind of 
figure it out. And you have more of the like melodic thing going on, whereas I'm usually doing like feedback stuff. So it like ends up working out. But yeah, it's definitely been cool and um, strange to collaborate. Um, I was reading this thing this morning about it was a hoax, but there people in the 1800s were like obsessed with um, sympathetic communication among snails. They were saying that um, when snails had sex, they formed like a psychic link um, that could travel like across the world. Um, I believe that. Yeah, and uh, basically, this one person was like trying to create like little devices using snails. <laughs> And would try and have snails like spell out words and things like that using basically trying to like make some sort of new telegram system using these snails. A shell phone. <laughs> um, anyways, I think the idea of sympathetic communication is really cool. And I feel like, um, you know, talking also about like what you were talking about with like the two pendulums swinging, that often really feels like that's all Violet and I were during our performances, that we were just two pendulums that would kind of, we were just swinging and like going in and out of sync. Um, snail sex, pendulums, psychic links. Yeah, it's really wild. I, I just think it's so cool that like two like or more bodies, whether those are human bodies or like a body in the environment, like will just automatically sync up with each other like we're constantly like trying to um and that i think really came out in yell's performance and like comes out in musical performance a lot um and yeah just like such a cool thing that our bodies do um i wanted to ask gladys a question about like what is the experience of being in that suit and like I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about that and like also what your thought process was in like constructing it. Yeah, it's in a way it's really limiting, which I never thought that it would be. My original idea was a sort of contact mic monster, a way to be able to not only feel the objects around me because I also love trash and I love their possible history, this sort of unknown history of them and the energy that they bring. And it's why I love trash and garbage so much because it's not that to me. It's, it has like this life of its own, but I sort of wanted to feel these things and, and be out with, with people and, and explore texture. Um, at first I would wear masks and not costumes per se but a way to to get rid of this physical body and have people focus on the sound and on what's going on and so the suit was i guess a way to to get closer to that and and to sort of be able to disappear and <laughs> run around and um not knowing what exactly i'm gonna do i feel like that was a more tame version but sometimes I I do let my body fully feel what is going on and and I won't know what I'm gonna do next or how it's gonna be so I felt that maybe being being untethered was a good thing but in a way I feel like it has boxed me in um, so that was interesting <laughs> uh, yeah what you're saying about not or about wanting to like disappear while being like at the center of attention like reminds me of when I perform solo I usually I haven't in a little while but I used to wear this cloak to sort of be the, the person behind the curtain kind of and to try to like point the focus at the music and not at me um, and would sort of let me like also kind of internal like feel like I was focused inside of myself rather than being very self-conscious and seeing everybody and uh seeing if people if they're looking at me or if they're not looking at me or whatever um and not doing that tonight was kind of a new thing um and i just 
for myself, I was just kind of like zoning out as much as I could, like staring at my keyboard or staring at the ground or staring up or whatever. Um, but yeah, that resonates with me too. Yeah, I loved it, y'all. It was really grandiose in a way where I, I guess just because I try and, and hone in on the sound too, but I think it's important that, that also, that's why sound to me more than anything, I mean, art is also can be sound, but it, it to me is like a physical thing, right? Sound is more of this intangible thing and being part of knowing that like the people here are also part of that as well and that hopefully like those sounds like when you were both syncing up really well with the baking sheet and and the sax it sort of un unlocks something and activates something in people too and that's I guess something I try and and do with my sounds is the concept that I never tell anyone like hopefully the sounds will activate something in in someone for them to want to do something in their life you know or or follow their intuition and say I felt that maybe I can feel that um, with it, something else I want to do in my life you know have y'all ever felt that way or... well I was gonna say I, I was moved to tears during the beginning of your set when you were singing that song it was so beautiful and the the words are really like resonating with me a lot like there's room for all of us and there's room for all of me or it's such a simple phrase but it, it struck me very much yeah same that part really moved me um the whole performance did and i, I think exactly what you're saying like there's it like struck something in me as a person who's listening but it's like i was you know I'm not just listening, I'm also like experiencing it and like feeling the effects of the performance and it was like really powerful, yeah. I am curious about how you described yourself as untethered because you were physically tethered to electricity and I thought that was really cool, like that's one of my favorite parts of that suit is just the like cool long cord coming from your back and there are just times where you just look like this like electricity monster just like hissing like voltage and song and it was like so cool um but yeah I guess I'm just interested in the like like you designed this suit to be untethered but you are still yeah, tethered. we're all tethered to something. <laughs> I didn't want to be the it's, one to say it. It's un unfortunate. Some some things, you know, the colonized brain, uh, which is going to take this whole lifetime and maybe the next one if there's another one to do it. But yeah, I don't I don't know. It's it's sort of like tethered to social media to promote the show or something. But it, I want to tell people in real life and I don't know I guess we are all tethered to something um, I wasn't trying to call you out I was just just wondering your thoughts you need you know fossil fuels make your phone and it's just a whole big circle <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but what is something I guess a question for all of you um, Zoe too because you you work in uh, body work and somatics, but like how, how does the, I guess this reality affect your work? Like what, what is something you do and to try and bear it <laughs> um, through, through your work of, of somatics and music and sound? Any personal practices to like bear this reality that we're living in? Yeah. Is that way too <laughs> deep of a question? Um, I mean, that's kind of why I lean more towards trash. I don't. I'm like not a gear kid. I don't care about buying things. I like just like accumulating things that I can find um, that other people would be getting rid of. And like finding a new use for them um, and that 
is at least one way of bearing the like physical reality of just how much garbage there is in this world and how no matter what I do, I'm going to just like produce and produce more garbage and it just makes me so sad. Um, so like, yeah, at the very least I can like find this stuff and maybe give it another use. Um, yeah, that's, that's my best answer. The reality is otherwise overwhelming. I got into playing saxophone because I, I saw somebody perform and it was just like such a visceral performance and it just like really struck me and I was like, I've been playing synthesizer for like 10 years and, but it feels very heady and like, I'm just kind of like thinking constantly and not really like feeling. Uh, and saxophone, I was just like, oh, that's a way that I can actually feel like embodied in my music. And it feels very like, there's an element of like therapy in blowing everything through the saxophone and yeah that's been like a big a big part of music for me and like my practice is like blowing stuff through the sax and just it, it like feels very visceral and very like deep uh in my body and it that feels it feels healing in a lot of ways for me and that's why i love blowing really long notes it's also like very meditative for me I think that's like a way of me coping with a lot of feelings that I have. Yeah. I liked being by the bell of your saxophone during the performance, and when I wasn't making noise, I would just hear like your your spit. There's a lot of it. I oh yeah. my gosh, I, there pro is a I lot produce of it. a I lot of tell. spit. Um, but that felt um, like the the visceral bodily reaction of, of what you were doing like i could like hear the the stuff that came out of you effluvia maybe that's the word uh if that's not the word <laughs> edit that out uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll fix that in post <laughs> yeah can we get that in post um but yeah it was just cool um to like yeah really hear what your body was up to other than just like the notes it was making. Yeah, I guess in response to your question, Gladys, like um, I think one of the things that in the video that I was trying to explore is just like how, how like we're constantly being aff affected by the sounds around us or like the state of the world around us. And that like, I don't know, I think it's really something I've been trying to do is just like really be more consciously aware of like the effects that the environments around me are having on me. Um, and then I think like, yeah, to like kind of give me agency to be able to like shift in ways that I can, like my environment or my surroundings, whether that's like in small ways or like in bigger ways of like yeah there's not enough like i yeah like social movement type type work that we need to do to feel more comfortable in this world um and then uh, i think personal practice just like movement like i think like despair can really register as like wanting to just like shut down and collapse and like there's just so much despair in the air so often and like I think one way for me to move through that is to like move and to keep myself moving and um, also just as a drummer like just that fully like em embodied expression of just like hitting and finding rhythm and like that is like a really powerful practice for me to like break my way out of that despair. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Does anyone out there have a question?
Yeah, totally. Great. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, Jackie's question for those watching at home is, um, uh, I'll, yeah, um, is, no, I just forgot the question. Um, oh, yeah, as a somatic practitioner, do I ever incorporate sound into my work? And um, I would, like, yes, on some levels. Like, there's definitely, like, making sounds with our bodies, like, emoting, expressing, um, vocalizing. Like, oftentimes, like, there's a lot of constriction um, for folks uh, in the throat and in, like, not wanting to express themselves as people. Um, and so working with, like, emoting and vocalization is a really big part of my practice. Um, and um, I, when I was researching for this video, I, uh, I came across this, like, YouTube um, hole around, like, sound healing, which I don't know that much about, but, like, this person whose video I was watching was saying that you could take a tuning fork and, like, find where someone has, like, where the sound is blocked in their body and then put the tuning fork over it and, like, clear it up. Oh. I don't know if that's real, but... I have some tuning forks, so we're yeah, going to test it. this out. <laughs> but, I mean, it's cool, and, it, like, yeah, I don't know how, I, like, what I think about that, but it, like, makes sense that our bodies are always emoting like vibrations um which is sound um that we can't hear and that's one thing that i'm listening for when i'm working with someone's body um but apparently the tuning fork can listen for it a lot better than i can so maybe i'll try that i want to just chime in with a thought that uh, sparked from what you were saying um I think there's like some interesting connection or something I've noticed and I've heard people talk about where like, you know, when you think about two notes that are really close together, when, when, they're, when there are two notes that are sounding and they're exactly the same, they sound in harmony. And then as they start moving apart, they become disharmonious and, uh, and, and that like dissonance can be really like stressful to listen to. And there's something about the closer that notes get together without actually being the same being more and more dissonant and more and more stressful and i think that that can be like i've noticed there are people who sometimes have really strong reactions to other people and when i'm on an outside perspective i'm like you two are like very similar and like i'm like you're like almost the same but i feel like there's like some kind not of dissonance quite, there. Quite there yeah <laughs> yeah so I don't know. I don't know what to make of that or what to call it, but I've just noticed that, and I feel like it has some kind of relevance to this conversation. <laughs> That's cool, Violet. Great observation. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I think, uh, oh yeah, the question was, um, in Zoe's video, she was talking about how sound has been weaponized and uh, across time, but it's specifically relating to the uprisings last year. Um, and I think that, I mean, I can say like, I've definitely been in situations where sound was directed towards me as a weapon or towards people around me as a weapon. Um, in 676 last year, the helicopters and all the, you know, tear gas and bullet, like rubber bullets being fired, all of that is very terrifying. And the sound is a very big part of that. Um, and I think that actually that's been like on my mind a lot 
um, as someone who's been in a lot of like noise spaces or like other like experimental music spaces, I, it's like as as a performer and also as a white performer living in a gentrifying neighborhood, I think a lot about like what is the music that I'm making and is it what effect is it having on people? And it's kind of I think the effect for me as I'm thinking about my art is like to push me away from some of my harsher tendencies. Even though I, I do love harsh noise, I think some some noise or some noise that people might describe as harsh to me is really beautiful. But I think that some of the noise I put out there, I sort of think of like how might it be received? And that's kind of pushed me towards some more like meditative, peaceful, like uh, like some of the saxophone stuff and some of the synthesizer stuff. It's like it's murky and it's eerie, but there's also sort of a like I don't know. I don't know how to describe it exactly, but it's definitely, yeah, I think that's definitely something that has, like, steered, steered the way that I write music a little bit. Yeah, I guess I'll expand on that, what I brought up in the video a little bit of, like, yeah, I, it's like, well, we know that like noise is being used intentionally um, by the cops and by the state, and I think sometimes it, there's like this way in which it can like drive us crazy because we don't know if it's like actually happening on purpose or not. And yeah, anyway, I just remember last year. Remember when like ATMs were exploding every night, or there were just explosions every night. Yeah, and then the fireworks, fireworks situation. Sigh. Yeah. There was a lot of confusion about that. People were like, maybe this is like intentional in some part, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the helicopters were circling in my neighborhood 24 7. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't sleep for like weeks. Um, and yeah, that definitely had an effect on me. Like, it was already so stressful in so many ways. I mean, for less for me than for a lot of people that were experiencing the direct impact of it. Um, but, yeah, it was a lot. I have a very visceral experience anytime I hear a helicopter now. I'm just, like, immediately thrown back to last summer because it was just such a constant. I'm just going to say Deuce also gets really scared of loud noises or like trash can closing or any sort of sudden boom. We're both like deathly afraid of those things when they happen. Um, it's really wild how that stays in, imprinted in your body because it's not just a scary feeling. It's like I can feel my whole body tensing up. Yeah, and it's interesting how, like, sound is perception and, like, how even, like, as we're, like, like, harsh noise artists might use, like, the sound of a screeching train and, like, amplify it times 10 and, like, then that, you know, might be a way, I think of it sometimes as a way of, like, reclaiming some of that, like, sound that, like, might have these these like negative associations is like because sound is like often associations like I had this bad experience with you know, door slamming like and I now I have like a traumatic response to it like so I think yeah noise just music can like just create this interesting space to like re remake those associations or like play with them and like shift them around I've also seen noise have the opposite impact on people where um, like they have like really intense visceral reactions that feel really bad um, because it reminds them of things from their past, um, which is really not ideal uh, for anyone involved. And it was at one time in particular, it was like really intense for this person I went to a show with and 
they had to like run out of the room because a, a sound that was happening reminded them of their a sound that their grandfather would made would make. Um, yeah, and that was really really wild to see, and it was such a personal experience. I'll repeat the question while we're thinking. <laughs> the question was, um, are there any sound? Actually, I, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Hmm. Are there any more ways of listening more deeply in your body that feel healing to you? Um, I leave my window open a lot, um, and it helps me feel in touch with my street and my neighborhood. Um, and I like kind of hate having to close my windows. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't necessarily have like specific healing practices, um, but I do think that. Um, there is a lot in the day-to-day -day experience that severs us from, like, um, I don't know, the world around us. And just having the window open is a way of healing that connection. And I can, like, hear if something fucked up is going on outside. Oh, sorry. I guess that's my one beat. I'm going to get beat. Um, I can hear if something's going on outside, or I can hear if something cool is going on outside, I don't know. Um, that is maybe the closest like thing I have to healing practice. Though I've never thought of it that way. I just leave the window open, similar to John Cage. Yeah, I think for me, like that question just makes me think of um, the, yeah, Polly and Oliveris who I talked about in the video and deep listening as a practice um, and yeah that's something that the Samizam Collective does um, and yeah just the practice of really listen the simple practice of listening to your environment around you um, how just that in itself can be really healing because I think we're often blocking sound we're just blocking a lot out um, and when we like open up our um, awareness to the world around us, it um, it shifts something in our nervous system because we can't if we're like hyper focused on one thing. Um, that's usually when our nervous systems are in kind of that like um, hyper vigilant response. So being able to like just notice like the soundscape around can just in and of itself can like shift the nervous system and be like a healing practice um, so that's something I like to do pretty often I guess I wouldn't say healing practice but I really love listening to cassettes as some less nostalgic and letting them sort of play out until the end um, and also sometimes playing them to where I can hear not 
the actual sound from the cassette, but actually hearing the mechanisms inside moving. And then I loved, I never knew those questions from Pauline because I really liked the way that it kept showing the divide between listening and hearing and how I think a lot of people really don't know the difference or know when, when one is one and how important that is, I think, to really understand and then help help to guide you to the present. And Will you say more about what that distinction is for you between hearing and listening? Yeah, yeah. I think about it that a lot, actually. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. To me, listening is is sort of attached to uh, some sort of critical thinking but after the fact right you're you're like fully taking in what is around but then really really asking those questions afterward but not not like i think hearing is a is it in passing and you and there's not much thought into it like I can hear a car, that car that just passed by, you know, but I wasn't really listening to which direction it was going or, you know, then listening to how it affects my, like how I felt about that because I like that sound, you know, or like the whoosh of the trolley, for example. But I don't know, what do you all think about it? Yeah, I, I, what you're saying resonates with me. I think listening to me feels more intentional and hearing might be like a more passive experience. There's sounds happening all the time and listening is like I'm, maybe I'm choosing to focus on something. Um, and the experience of watching Zoe's video really like put me in this place where I feel like I was listening, where like I'm hearing all these sounds that I like are happening around me. It, it's like it shifted my perception and like, it's like once somebody draws attention to it, like, are you listening right now? Are you listening to everything that's happening around you? It kind of just like opens up my brain a little bit and I can realize that there's crickets chirping and cars passing and the wind and the scraping of the ground or whatever it might be, um, which I've been hearing, but maybe not listening to. I find that sometimes hearing forces me to listen. Um, like it happened like a couple of seconds ago when there was some cool like kind of skittering sound above and I like stopped paying attention. Sorry to what you were saying, Violet. I totally I heard like, that too, yeah. What is that cool sound? And I, I'm i like, um, I think uh one of my most favorite things in just like experiencing the world is when like i'm hearing but not listening but then i get totally overwhelmed by something like unexpected and cool and um like uh, some weird little skittering above me um and i think i don't know listening listening can be intentional but i, I think it can be something that is sort of forced upon you in, in ways or it like takes you by surprise and all of a sudden you're like listening. Yeah, I was taken by surprise the other day because my heart was beating really fast. And then I could, like I didn't even have to, I could hear it just in, and I can't usually feel like I hear it. I'd have to put my hand up or something, but I could hear it and then and then I just put my hand like over where my uterus is and I could feel my heartbeat down there too. And I was like, what the heck is going on right now? It was crazy. I don't know if you hear sounds from your, in your body sometimes, that also freaks me out. I'm like, I can hear what's going on in there in other, in other ways. It's not like a little fart stuck or anything. Like it's really, you, I can like sometimes feel the molecules. I don't know. It's, that's crazy. No, it's not. 
Our bodies make so many sounds. It's really wild. It's like uh, bringing it back to John Cage. He he was like obsessed with not hearing sounds from the world, so he went to an anechoic chamber, and he was still hearing so much stuff. And he like went outside and was like, "Why am I still hearing so much?" And they were like, "That's just your body, like in absence of all sound." all like external sounds you just hear yourself so cool oh, it is so cool sound incredible they can stay Thank you, SMC. Thank you. Zoe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. You're amazing. You are the best. And live from New York, it's Saturday night. <laughs>